walked into my first investment banking interview at Bank of America, my interviewer handed me a sheet of paper which said, investment banking is a business where thieves and pimps run freely on the corridors and the few good men die the death of a dog. <laughs> and in big, bold letters at the bottom it said, there is also a negative side. My interviewer, who was wearing a cowboy hat, looked straight into my eyes and very sternly asked me my first interview question. Which one of the three are you? This was my first formal introduction to the world of Wall Street. Uh, I had wanted to be on Wall Street since I was 13 years old. Uh, I also wanted to own a yellow convertible and a blue motorboat. I was very, very, <laughs> I was very specific about the colors as well. So I worked really hard, I made, made my way through all of these interview questions, and I secured that coveted banking offer uh, in 2006 when the markets were at an all-time high. Now in course of becoming a banker, um, just before I got my banking offer, I had a near-death experience that uh, forced me to inquire a little deeper. And so I did one more crazy thing, apart from becoming a banker. Um, I decided to live in a monastery in the Lower East Side as a monk and work on Wall Street at the same time. And I did that for two years. And life was very exciting at first because I was not just an investment banker. I was an investment banker who knew how to meditate. And not just meditate. I meditated for two hours a day with monks. And I also taught meditation. And I made sure that everyone around me, including my colleagues, knew about that. <laughs> right? Networking events, morning conversations, I would just sprinkle it very casually. That guy. <laughs> and I would see the expressions on people's faces, and I, I knew that my coolness index was on the rise. Now, in an environment where every associate's performance is very closely monitored and very quickly judged, I stumbled upon what was the biggest challenge of my life. I was the only person in a class of 72 associates who joined banking that year to fail the major financial services exam that any banker has to take at the beginning of his or her career. It's the Series 7, for some of you who know what that is an eight-hour exam, and I was the only person to fail it. And when you start your career on that track, you are immediately black marked. Now, there's one word that I have avoided like plague my entire life, and that's the F word, failure. And that afternoon, as I walked out of my examination center at 100 William Street, I actually took a little extra time in the restroom because I did not want to be seen by any of my classmates. There was such an intense sense of personal failure, and tons and tons of shame. In my mind, I was thinking, this is the end of my career. I would be overshadowed by my colleagues. I would never get staffed on those high-profile deals. And worst comes to worst, when the time for layoff does happen, I'll be on the top of the list. This had actually become truth in my mind. My Blackberry was buzzing. My colleagues wanted to find out how I did. And I had no courage to pick it up. I walked out of the building so much in fear. And in a desperation to save my face, I told myself, you know what? I'm just going to go into work and say, I passed the exam. Only the HR is going to get the results of the test anyways. Right, so I readjusted myself, put on that smooth game face, and went back home to the monastery. And a couple of monks asked me, so how was it? How did it go? I said, pretty good. <laughs> you know, just walked. And decided not to think about that for the, for the rest of the day. But that evening, as I was sitting with my meditation practice, I felt uneasy about something. And my usual tendency is that emotions slow me down. Emotions are like speed bumps that come in the way of efficiency. 
so I don't really look at it. But that evening, somehow I felt I needed to introspect a little more. And as I looked at it deeper, I realized that in my pursuit of achievement, my headlong rush to constantly achieve in life, I had completely forgotten who I was deep down inside. I had just become this compulsive achievement machine that could do anything to keep my image alive so that I can get claps from an audience. And what was even more horrifying was the fact that I went around saying that I was a mindfulness practitioner. And at the same time, had made this internal decision to speak a lie about my failure. Like the, the startling inconsistency, the convenient compartmentalization where I can just not be consistent. I can be a mindfulness practitioner and at the same time go about my life in my day-to-day -day interactions, not bring anything of mindfulness into it, and still feel very comfortable and feel good about myself. And when I saw that, it was extremely painful. And all I could do at that time was just stay with it and accept the fact that I was being a hypocrite. The next day, I went into work. And of course, all of my colleagues were very eager to find out how I had performed in my test. Um, and I was still deeply internally conflicted, wounded. Uh, I just gathered all my courage, looked up, and I said I failed. And there was silence. And every single moment of that silence pierced through the pores of my body. A few consolations floated, and the crowd dispersed. And as I went and sat back in my seat, I felt this relief, the sense that this big load had been lifted off my chest that I did not need to wear a mask anymore of being the successful person. I did feel vulnerable, but there was something very lighthearted in that vulnerability. There was something very lighthearted in the fact that I could just be a human, and I need not be a superhuman. That evening, one of my colleagues, Matt, came to my cubicle, and he said, uh, you just accepted your failure so easily. You just said you failed. <laughs> no excuses. I said, thank you for being so trustworthy. And in the weeks to come, more bankers were interested in meditation and learning meditation from me than ever before. <laughs> and I could have never planned or strategized for that to happen. So this experience taught me a very simple yet a very important lesson. My colleague Matt knew that I was a mindfulness practitioner, but neither my successful image as a banker nor my being a mindfulness practitioner impacted him. It probably impressed him, but it never impacted him. What impacted him was me relinquishing an image of being great, including that of being greatly mindful. So I would like to leave you with an introspection. How often during our day-to-day -day interactions, whether at work or at home, are we constantly seeking validation for a self-image? Are we aware of it? And how often are we using mindfulness to bolster that self-image and continue to play that image game? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rosana. So we're going to have a, a brief conversation and then open it up to you. So if you have questions, we'll, we'll open it up to the floor soon. I've never heard that story. Thank you for sharing. Um, what, I mean, I'm curious, first of all, what, what possessed you to make that decision to be both a monk and work on Wall Street? You mentioned the, the cool factor. 
<laughs> the cool factor was definitely very critical. It was almost <laughs> like, it was, it was uh, at, at, at least at the beginning, um, um, there is this desire to prove to yourself that uh, everything under the sun is possible, right? Um, mm. Mission impossible when we talk about Tom Cruise. The, 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 whole, the, whole, uh, the whole notion that uh, nothing under the sun is impossible for me and wanting to prove that to yourself, to be that superhuman, was the, uh, was, it was, so it was mixed. On one level, there was definitely a desire to go deeper. Mm -hmm. But you see how uh, our motivations are not always fully pure. Like there's so much gray. Um, and uh, sometimes it's very important to look at the grayness and really know how to separate the black and white, and I did mm. not. Uh, so I, I went in there thinking, yeah, I just want to be a mindful person, and this is what I'm going to do. But there was definitely an image game underneath. So I would say both played a role in it. Interesting, and so at the time, it sounds like maybe you weren't fully aware yes. of the cool, the cool motivation. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, I can say um, it's at the back of your mind. Yeah. But again, we know how to compartmentalize it. Uh, we are masters at justification, right? Uh, we are masters at externalization. Mm -hmm. So I just very conveniently you know, <laughs> placed that at the back. <laughs> so I'm curious, when you went back to the monastery that night, I mean, you've made this decision. You made a change mm -hmm. to stop lying and to start telling the truth especially when you went into, the, into your office the next day, but what role do you feel like being a monk, your meditation practice played in that decision, if any? When you have to sit down and meditate, um, this comes up many times when people ask me about meditation and say it's very difficult for me to sit down for 10 minutes and really uh, meditate. Meditation also brings up uh, emotions things yeah. that are unprocessed, insecurities that uh, I have not fully dealt with and looked at. And usually the tendency, and sometimes we also adopt meditation as a practice to, uh, to actually numb them mm -hmm. rather than go into them. Mm. Um, so in this situation, in this particular situation, for me, um, somehow that evening I felt that I should stay with it. Mm and look at it deeply and see where these feelings of uneasiness are actually coming from. Because I felt that there was a clue uh, to the inconsistencies that I felt in my life that were existing. I never really looked at them. But uh, that, those emotions really stirred up a more query into the inconsistencies. Mm. So that's what meditation, and meditation has the power to do that if you're sincere about it. And we need to be sincere about it. Yes. That resonates so much. Because you mentioned this pain, like how painful that was to feel that, that you were inconsistent with who you were presenting yourself to be. And I feel like so much of the time, especially, I mean, I've certainly had this experience as we're practicing mindfulness or other contemplative practices, we become more aware of that gap between the person we truly want to be and then I see it in myself. I'll see certain moments where I'm acting in a way that's inconsistent, that you know, I'm, I'm not as mindful as I want to be, or I would say something that would come out before I really thought it through. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, that happened way before I ever meditated, but, but having this practice brings it to the fore. That's right. And it makes it, in a way, so much more painful. Right. But then you had the courage to investigate where that pain was coming from. Right, exactly. That was, that was it. That's all I did. I investigated into it, and I decided to stay with it. Um, not, you know, usually it's flight, flight, flight or flight response, sometimes mm -hmm. even freeze, not do anything. But uh, to stay with it uh, and to really see where it's coming from. Um, what I also realized is it actually gives you strength of character that like nothing else does. Mm. Uh, your life becomes this, uh, this crucible uh, for the lack of a better term, that starts to distill what's pure from what's, what's contaminating. When you stay in the pain and really look at its origins, but it takes patience, mm -hmm. it takes courage, and it takes strength of character. So much so, and I feel like we do want to get away. I, I know that for many years I wanted to get away from any discomfort, any of the afflictive emotions, so how, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but how do we do that? How do we actually move into these emotions rather than saying, 
I'm going to get another brownie or check my smartphone for the 10th time in this you know, two minute span. How do, we, how do we stop numbing ourselves or, or acting out on those emotions? How do we just fully move into them? The two things that have helped me personally that I can share, um, uh, one is having a, a very good, wise, trusted friend in your life mm. <laughs> uh, that you can talk to. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is not necessarily a therapy session, but it's actually a vulnerability session. Of course, therapy sessions are also vulnerability sessions, but this is, this is more um, along the lines of being able to fully make yourself vulnerable, because when we learn how to do that in the most effective way in a trusted circle, then it also helps us be more comfortable with ourselves. That's number one. And number two is right. Uh, write about your emotions, write about your feelings, look at them again the next day. Hmm. Um, and that helps us dig deeper. Mm -hmm. uh, seeing it outside of ourselves rather than it just going in my head and in my heart and, and just living in it, just putting it outside of yourself and then learning to look at it, stepping away from it, helps mm -hmm. in a very big way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll say when I was in, in medical school, there was a time it was, I'd stopped listening to a lot of my instincts, my my true inner voice, and I kind of went so far away from that, and I felt all these emotions coming up, and I literally at one point decided I needed to take a few weeks off, and I did, and I just started writing. And literally, I would bring my laptop to the local cafe, and every day I would just write for hours. And I wrote so much, I haven't even read all of it since then, but there was something so important about actually getting it out there, right. and then being able to see it in front of me. It really, it was such a cathartic process, and it helped me to actually be with what was happening rather than before it wasn't a conscious avoidance, but schedules. And I feel like that's another way that in our lives, most of us in this room are probably really busy, right? And, and we have our jobs, we have our families, we have so many commitments that it, that can be another way to avoid actually being with right. what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. And then vulnerability, that's, it takes a lot of courage. It does, it does. But, uh, but how are we going to learn courage until we practice it, right? It's uh, <laughs> a, a part of courage is, um, is, is that, so you can be courageous if there is no fear. That just, <laughs> just doesn't work, right? Uh, it's one of those paradoxical things where when you have to build courage, that means you're walking through uncertainty, you're walking through fear. And that's the only way it gets built, right? So, uh, so if, I, if I really ask myself, do I have an option? I don't think so. Of course, mm -hmm. I have to be intelligent about how I do it. But mm -hmm. uh, do I have an option of not doing it? Probably not. Of not doing? Of not making myself vulnerable? Mm. If I have to really grow, well, that's, that's, that requires us to step out, step out into uncertainty, mm -hmm. really go there with courage. And people meet you there. Co mm -hmm. Matt, your that's colleague, right. met you there. That's right. Um, and Brene Brown spoke at ABC Home, who gave the she gave the amazing TED Talk on vulnerability. She was there last week, and what was so beautiful is that she not only spoke about this topic, but clearly in her TED Talk, and also last week she really embodied it. So she got out on stage and she said, I almost ditched this whole thing to go shopping. <laughs> she was like, I wish I could say I was kidding. She, she described how nervous she was. She said, you know, I judge a talk by how nauseous I feel before I go out. And I'm, I'm pretty nauseous right now. <laughs> and, and what happened is exactly what's happening here. Everyone started laughing. There was really hearty laughter, and we were all on her side. And it's exactly what she teaches, this idea of that courage, you know, the word courage actually comes from the Latin root cur, which is, you know, like the French root cur, or corazón in Spanish, heart. So that living courageously is wholehearted living. Right. And we, we are, I've, I have found this many times in my own life, uh, you're received on the other side like you never thought you would be. It's like, it's like yeah. a child jumping from the wall and the father just gonna hold the child and the child mm -hmm. is gonna jump and afraid. And the father's gonna say, just jump, I'll hold you. Right? And the child jumps. And for the first few seconds, it's like, <gasps> you know, and then <laughs> the father holds and yeah, trust builds. Yes. There's so much more strength for courage. Yes. And then I find that, so it's that faith that we will be caught. Right. And it's also, in, in my own experience, it's knowing that I'm going to be okay, right. 
even if I'm not, not caught. caught. That's right. That but is there's, right. there's an okay, basic, you know, like there's an okayness whether or not the external environment responds in that way. If, because if I, if I knew about the result 100%, mm -hmm. and that's what we all want, right? We all want certainty. <laughs> well, if I'm going to take this leap, how do I know that I will not land? Mm -hmm. But the thing with courage is you don't know. And yet you, you, the one thing that you do know deep inside is that if I don't do this, I will stay a prisoner for the rest of my life. Oof, that's good. That's, that's really good. I mean, not to be a prisoner, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that point that you're making, absolutely. And so we live in these confines of our minds and can we actually live a fully liberated life? What questions do we have? Because I'm sure, I mean, Rajnath says a lot of, He's dropped a lot of amazing wisdom here. Hi, I'm Sherry, I'm from New York. Um, I had a question, because it sounds like you've had some great experience bringing folks who maybe you know, didn't have a background in meditation or mindfulness, opening up their eyes to the joy it gives them. Um, I actually work for a meditation organization and I, I have the pleasure of helping us uh, grow and stuff. And I've been trying to share it with, let's say, people in more my social or personal world who are generationally or culturally um, uh, unfamiliar, disinterested, uh, and uh, have a, a hardness when presented with stuff like that. And folks, including folks who have, you know, maybe serious medical stuff where I could see how it would help them. Other than trying to provide a good example yourself by the changes it brings to you and how it increases your compassion for them and your own productivity and all of that, do you have tips or thoughts on how best to bring other people to the water if they're not even aware that they need a drink, <laughs> that a drink might be delicious? Um, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts to share on that. And thank you for your time and thoughts. Thank you. Um, it's a, it's a very good question. It's also a question that uh, is uh, it's a challenge that I'm facing at this, uh, this time in my life. Um, I faced that over time when I worked on Wall Street. Yeah. Um, and the one thing that I do know, this is the simplest way I can say it, um, is it's so important to keep trying. Because the world is also working in a way that at some point in time or the other, it's going to click. What you have been saying all along <laughs> will suddenly, based on a certain circumstance, a certain situation, will suddenly be like, oh yeah, I get it now. Right? And that's the, uh, that's the hard part of being a teacher, a meditation teacher specifically, is it takes patience to be with somebody uh, through the journey, even when they are not necessarily receptive and that's what compassion is. Compassion is never letting go, even when somebody is not taking it at that point in time. That's unconditional love. Mm. Right? And what unconditional love takes is repeated trying um, and, and then hoping and praying that at a certain time uh, they, will, they will get it. And it does happen. I've seen, I've seen people who have come around five years, six years afterwards, something happened mm. and oh my gosh, afterwards the way they take to it is incredible, right? So that's, uh, that's something that I, I practice, I live it, I try to live it. Uh, and the other thing is again, you know, never stop being an example. Never stop being an example. Uh, it, it really affects people in a very deep way. Uh, we may not know it immediately, but uh, it does affect people in a very deep way. I don't know if that directly answered your question. Thank you. So we are, Running down on time, but I do want to take a couple of more questions quickly. So, and if you could stand up or wave when you get the mic, that would be. Hi, I'm Liz. Uh, I worked on Wall Street for 17 years, so I, you know, I feel your pain, and Thank you. <laughs> I, I really applaud what you've what you've done in terms of, um, you know, kind of going deeper into this conversation about mindfulness uh, on Wall Street and elsewhere. Um, it seems like I'm, I'm kind of trying to pull together a, a lot of different things that I've heard over the last couple of days, but yesterday we had a cardiologist who said, you know, the reason that big banks are exploring mindfulness is like too many suicides. And then, you know, our last speaker was talking about stress management and your colleague Max came to you, you know, with this, this same like, wow, you were really able to accept your failure. Mm -hmm. 
And all of that is certainly like very, very important. But I still think there's a, just this bigger opportunity for you know, sort of values and culture on Wall Street. Do you think that it's too idealistic to believe that if you start to introduce mindfulness, even in this small way of, or not so small, but even at a, a personal level of trying to deal with your own stress, that it eventually expands to change kind of the, the plane and change the culture so that you don't have to be, I don't know, a thief, a pimp, or a good man dying in the street <laughs> like a dog or something? <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think meditation has several benefits, and as you said, um, you know, stress relief is, is definitely a big one. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, what do we do after our stress has been, re our stress has been relieved? <laughs> um, right. So, so what, what I think is important is to constantly keep moving people from one, one, one step to another. Mm -hmm. So the first step may, and this is something that everybody can easily relate to, especially in Wall Street, stress levels are extremely high. Um, you know, keep up that image, and it definitely helps reduce stress levels. And once they feel that benefit, then, um, you know, the, I, I usually like to say, give people what they want so that they can really give them what they need, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but it's important for us to know and for us to have lived and understood very deeply what is it that we as humans actually need at the core? And we all know that answer, it's love, mm. right? Uh, but then to get there takes steps. So step one, stress. Step two, um, you know, personal awareness, understanding purpose. There are various ways in which we can approach it. Then eventually, does it lead people to becoming more loving, more empathic, more kind to each other? So we can easily lose sight of that and just stay at the level of stress management. So it's, it's, it's doing both. It's doing what is necessary to get people to start and at the same time, also moving them forward towards where you, where you want to see them be. Mm. So both are equally important. Beautiful. I think that's a perfect place to, to wrap up this conversation um, in terms of it really being all about getting to that place of love. And sometimes you give people what they want to get to it, really what they need. Thank you so thank much, Rajanath. So thank you, thank you.